These are the men and women of Beaver Valley, the bravest of the brave. They fought fearlessly for their country, their city, their community, and for the ideals we share as Americans. They served proudly in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Here, now, are their stories, their own experiences in their own words, the words of the heroes of Beaver Valley. After completing his education at Geneva College and Asbury Theological Seminary, 77-year-old New Brighton native Keith Stanner officially entered the ministry with his first church in Fox Chapel. Around that time, the Vietnam War was reaching its peak. In 1968, Stannert felt a calling to volunteer as an army chaplain. My mother was totally against it. She didn't want to have anything to do with the military. Told me if I ever went in the military, she would never look at me. And, uh, but once I got in, she was taking me pictures of me and all that kind of stuff, so she got over it. Even though Stannert had joined as a chaplain, he and the other men still had to go through basic training at Fort Hamilton. And one of the things we thought we would be treated like chaplains and uh, with kid gloves, well, that was totally wrong. In fact, the uh, Green Berets uh, made a point out of giving us the worst possible experience they could give us, including uh, they made us go through a, an area which is several hundred yards wide, and we had to try to get through that area without getting captured. I was one out of, uh, I think, three that made it through without getting captured. And, uh, but what I did, I laid down in the bushes and just watched what was happening. And they, they had one place where they were capturing them all, and they would run and get them, put them in a truck. Well, I watched this happen. And so finally I decided when they were taking the one guy, one guy they caught back to the truck, that's when I made my dash. After his chaplain courses and basic training, Stannert was sent to Fort Rucker in Alabama, where many helicopter pilots were trained and operated from. We had constant deaths. Daily there were being many deaths. And my job and the other chaplains, one of our main jobs, was notifying the, uh, the spouses uh, of the death of their husbands and so forth. And that was really, really a tough thing to do because I remember one of them very vividly that uh, they had just gotten married, bought a brand new mobile home, he went over to Vietnam, his very first flight, he was shot down and killed, and I had to go and notify her. She just went blank. And I opened my mouth, I literally could not speak. I was caught up with so much emotion for her at that time that I could not get a word out. And, uh, but we had to do that constantly. Every day, two, three, four, uh, we would have to notify them. And the hardest thing to do is to leave your family, knowing you may never see them again in this life. And uh, I cried, I bawled like a baby when I said goodbye to my family, because there was obviously a very good chance. And I can think of in, when I was in Vietnam, probably at least 10 instances where I could have easily been killed. In April 1969, Stannert left for Vietnam, arriving a few days later at Tan Son Nhut Air Base. But I remember the first night that I was there, now, I was in a, they put me in a little building, and I was by myself. And all I kept hearing was gunfire, because the guards, they'd be shooting. And Tonsonud had been attacked and destroyed, literally just months before I arrived there. It was one of the main places where our troops would come in. And in fact, I remember coming in on a plane, we were on a civilian airline. And as we were coming in, the pilot said, uh, gentlemen, he said, please turn off your lights and shut your windows. And they kind of looked, everybody looked at each other and they said, we have to do that because if we don't, we will get shot down. Well, that night, all these gunfire, I was just sure the next shot was going to kill me for sure. <laughs> Stannert was assigned to Doc To, which was located on the border of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia just five miles from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But when I got there, I remember going to my hooch, which was like a tent that I was staying in. I sat down on the step on and tried to catch my breath, and all of a sudden I heard somebody yell, INCOMING! 
uh, what, what, what do you mean incoming? Everybody's running in every direction. Well, we were getting hit. That was the first of 50 consecutive days of rocket attacks. Well, I took off running because I was supposed to go to the medical place because that's where they brought in anybody that was injured or killed or anything like that. And I tripped over the concertina wire and uh, cut my hand. Well, when I got there later, they tried to give me a purple heart for that because they said, well, you were hurt during combat. And I said, there's no way you're gonna give me a purple heart. And anybody asked me, I'm gonna explain because I was scared to death and I tripped. We had uh, services, memorial services for uh, all the guys that were killed. And uh, uh, we would occasionally get letters from mothers wanting to know uh, what they wanted to know more about how their son was killed. And there was one that stood out in my mind. And uh, we, uh, our com one of our companies, their commo shack, where the radios and all were, took a direct hit. And we had uh, like eight guys who were killed and a lot of others wounded. Well, the guy that was operating the radio, the rocket literally landed in his lap. There was absolutely nothing left of him, nothing no remains at all. He was completely destroyed, blown up. A while later, I get a letter from his mother, and she wanted to know why they wouldn't let her open the casket. Well, I knew there was no body in that casket. That's what I knew, because there was no body to put in it. And, uh, but try to be kindness, I just told her, I said, well, quite often, you know, the bodies are not always recovered and shipped right away and sometimes the bodies are you know they have different decay and we did have situations where that happened and uh, decay and so forth and so it, they just don't think it's a good idea for families to open the caskets. Stannert stayed at Docto with the 299th Engineering Battalion. Danger lurked everywhere and he had several brushes with death. Our battalion commander called all the officers together during this 50 days that we were being rocketed. And very somberly, he looked at all of us and he says, we are all going to die tonight. Go, do whatever you can to prepare your men because we, we won't survive the night. And then he went on to say, we have about 500 men here we're basically engineers. We don't have a lot of weaponry. Fourth infantry is down. And they can't get here to help us because of the weather. We're on our own. The Army has confirmed that there are 5,000 Viet Cong within five miles of our border, and they intend to wipe us out tonight. And um, so he said, that's what's going to happen. And they were even, ho uh, uh, Hanoi Hanna, which was a radio broadcast, she even had bragged on the radio that day that Ho Chi Minh was going to have his lunch on our airstrip the next day. The battalion commander ordered Stannert to go around and check in on the men in the guard towers along the perimeter. There wasn't one single one of those that didn't welcome me with open arms and say, chaplain. And they would talk. Some of the guys that were Catholics were wanting to confess their sins, you know, and say, you know, and all that, because we knew we were going to die that night. So I did that. Guess what? Next morning, we weren't attacked. Forty years later, at our reunion, our battalion commander was there, and we were talking about this. And I said, "Sir, give me your take on this." And he said, well, he said, we know there was 5,000 troops. We know they were intending to wipe us out. But he said the next morning, the army could not find a trace of one single Viet Cong. They were totally gone. So I looked at him and I says, well, sir, why do you think they didn't attack us that night? He got a big smile on his face and he says, Chaplain, I think you, you know the answer. The answer is simple, God. God delivered us that night and, and nobody will deny that. Stannert served three total years in the Army 
with one full year in Vietnam, where he earned a Bronze Star. Today, he visits veterans' hospitals in the area to offer his services to former soldiers. He has also written a book about his experience, which is due to be published in about a year.